report on this computer. And we are recording. Okay. Go ahead, Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, hey, everybody, we'll call this meeting to order. It's 533, uh, item A, check. Uh, item B, roll call, Chair Seth here, Vice Chair Ned. Present. Alder Randy. Present. Corey from Parks. Present. John. Present. Julia. Present. Cody. Present. And Mark. Present. All right. Go ahead, Seth. On to C, approval of the agenda for today. There's a mind you, Sarah, second. By John. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Or raise. All those opposed? All right. And then we'll move on to approval of the minutes from August 12th. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Alder Randy. Is there a second? Second. By Mark. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, that's good. OK. <clears throat> and we are on to regular business. On to regular business. All right. Uh, item one, consideration with possible action on the installation of a solar array at Lake Park and the additional installation of an charging station. Okay, just give me one second to pull up the document that is in your packet. <clears throat> And I think we'll start with the, uh, the, let's start with the committee attachment instead of the graphic. There we go. That's a good one. All right. And I am sharing my screen. Um, so we had, and I'll just get us kicked off and then um, Corey can um, come in and, and supplement and then we can have a conversation. Um, um, so, yes, thank you, sweetheart. Um, so we, this is the um, readout for the EV charging station in terms of the electricity that it generates. Let me just pull this down park usage rather, sorry, not generation, but usage. And when we had um, uh, talked about putting in, uh, first of all, fixing the solar array, which I had said did come in a little higher than we had thought in terms of cost. Um, one of the add-ons that the committee had decided was to put in an EV charger. Um, you know, after staff looked at it a little more carefully, we realized that this would probably not be a good place to put an EV charger. Um, but I think appropriately, uh, committee member or vice chair Dorf um, said that we should just talk about it and uh, have some conversation and make some decisions about what we're going to do regarding this particular solar array. And uh, really, I think there's a larger conversation to have around whether or not the parks department is the appropriate department for um, managing EV charging. So. Um, there is one other screen that I'll share when it's uh, read, when um, Corey Meme is ready. Um, but yeah, uh, Corey, why don't you uh, take it from here? Sure. So yeah, the graphic that you have up right now, um, the green line was actually a, an assumption made by um, Eland Electric as to what they, they thought the EV charger would generate once the uh, solar array was updated and now the panels were replaced. Um, so I wanted to clarify that. And then yes, the, the other colored lines relating to the years um, past of historic usage um, are for the most part um, accurate with, I do wanna let you know there were some assumptions made as far as the 2019 usage when this graphic was put together. 
Um, and then also Jesse reminded me that because the solar panel was um, in need of repair during some of these times that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, um, it's a good reflection of, of what was used, but I guess just know that because the panels <laughs> were in need of repair, um, you know, there are some assumptions we need to make. So I think it might make sense to move on to the next graphic. Sure, just give me one second. Um, Jesse, it just might help, sure, as far as um, making things clear, hopefully for, as to, you know, what these graphics are showing. Okay, so basically if you kind of start with the notes he has, the green line again is showing um, what the solar array is generated or has generated. Um, he did use the numbers that were from 2020 since the array has been updated in this, but then you might note at the bottom of the page where he says that there were some fake numbers put in just to show as an example, and it really kind of reflects back to the historic usage in the park um, when those assumptions were being made. So basically what he's saying is again anything, any, so the blue line is showing what was consumed, anything below the green line um, is amount that you would get credited for, and then you know as you move over kind of to the September, October, anything above that green line is what we would be charged for. Mm -hmm. So in essence, I think what we're trying to show here is that there are times of year when the solar array is not going to be fully um, covering the usage of, of the electrical components that are out there already, and that's not even including the EV charger. So that's mainly, um, you know, outlets for events and lighting for the park and things like that. So. Um, that being said, um, I tried to, I asked Jesse if he could help us try and figure out what some potential costs might be associated with the EV charger, or I guess more how much energy might be generated by um, having the EG, EV charger on site. And so again, there were a lot of variables here. Um, there are different chargers we could use, which would use different amounts of energy, and so we made some assumptions. Um, Jesse thought that if we used 4.8 kilowatts at, say, eight hours per day, that we could generate about 1,152 kilowatt hours per month of usage. Um, I guess if you refer back to kind of the historic usage, you can see how that compares. And um, in some cases, I mean, that would almost double or, you know, the amount already being used in the park. So um, there's trying to put some costs to it and that type of thing. The, it, if, if enough energy isn't being generated by the panels, we could say spend up to $150 per month about to fund that. So now currently the parks department is not in um, support of incurring costs associated with the EV charger. And you all may recall, I you know, brought that up as a concern um, at the initial, when we were talking through this um, prior to approving it. And so um, it is something that currently we're not in support of, um, but would be open to the possibility of perhaps a pay station if, the commission and everyone felt it would still, you know, um, be the best use of money to put towards an EV charger at the park. We would be open to that, but not necessarily in support of funding costs towards the ongoing energy usage. Um, and then I did just want to point out too that I referenced the application that was submitted to the city of Green Bay for the excess stadium sales tax. Um, and when you look at what the objectives are for the project development, um, it states that 
you should look at what the um, the project should look at what future costs could be incurred if the project is funded using one of using one time excess stadium sales tax. Um, ask what will be the ongoing operating costs for the program or facility that would require ongoing city community support. How will those ongoing operating needs be filled? So that question was asked in the application. Um, it wasn't addressed, I guess, you know, as things were approved um, by either the Sustainability Commission or Council. Um, and then it goes on to to state um, where Elon provided an explanation of how the project would have an impact for the city and its taxpayers. And it asks, will it reduce future borrowing needs to the city? Um, and in the description, it says that this project would have a net positive effect for the city and residents by reducing the annual energy expense of the city and preventing future property tax increases due to increased utility spending. So I guess what I'm getting at here again is that um, really the intention of the funding was to reduce costs to the city and not to incur more costs to the city. Um, so, you know, I think kind of the bottom line really is that um, the ongoing funding for the uses of, of the charger has not been approved by the city council. Um, so that's something we need to consider. The project was over budget as far as just the installation of the solar array and inverter. Um, and so again, the funding was intended to reduce costs to the taxpayer and um, that in essence, city staff feels that the remaining funding would be better used to fund projects that could reduce funding for the city. So are there questions? <laughs> Just a clarification question. You mentioned that it would based on like like an estimate, it would be $150 per month um, for full usage. Is that the months where uh, the, the panels aren't producing as much, like where the, the green dips below the blue, or is that $150 averaged out over 12 months? I guess that would be the average cost if it were used eight hours per day. So um, we can take that into consideration, you know, versus whether or not the panel is generating enough um, in comparison to those charts that we're looking at. So um, I, I guess it would be a cost if, if, we, if the panel wasn't in place and we had to pay WPS to fund it, that's an approximate cost of what it would be. So do you have like a figure on like based on what the panels will produce over a 12 month period and how much uh, energy would be consumed by full utilization or, or a guess at that and whether that does cost money or if there is net savings over the year? Um, I don't, to be honest with you, I struggled with putting numbers to this um, and because there are so many variables and things so, but I think, you know, kind of referring back to the very first graphic and the green line, um, I think just by a quick glance at it, it looks to me as though about half of the year, say, um, we would be not producing enough energy. So even say at six months per, you know, times that $151, whatever amount that might be. Um, could be kind of a starting point. Um, you know, our park hours, I believe are, I should know this, but I think like 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or something. So it's really more than that eight hours that we're projecting. So would we only allow it to be used during that, when park hours are open? Do we just do an eight hour window? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions, I guess, that would need to be answered. <clears throat> So we really don't know if this would save us or cost us money over the course of a calendar year to have an EV charger in? There would not be a savings to us by any means to have the EV charger installed, but there would be costs incurred. I just don't know exactly what those might be.
Other questions? Yeah, I, I had a question along the same lines um, as Seth did. Could you go back, Celestine, please, to the other graphic showing the two lines? Okay, so the blue line is the amount of usage by the EV charger or by the entire park itself? Okay, so the blue line is what was used by the park. The green line is showing what was generated by the solar array. Right, so regardless of whether we put an EV charger in or not, it's not going to cover the total usage of the park in certain months, correct? Correct. So um, I guess our question, it kind of remains like how much more would an EV charger take away from the savings? Because we're definitely going to be saving money by putting in solar panels at the park compared to what we spend normally every year. Well, that is true, um, but because the solar panels have been in place, and like I mentioned, they weren't necessarily functioning correctly, so they weren't generating as much as, um, you know, could be like they are now, I guess our current budget for the city is reflecting the historic use and the historic solar array being a part of the budgeting, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think what's kind of getting con conflated here is the idea that we're going to somehow be spending more money by putting solar panels in, right? No, by putting EV <laughs> chargers in. Yeah, yes. well, right. yeah, but I think the way it's being presented is, is sounding like um, the, the Parks Department is incurring new costs by us putting solar panels in, but that's not true. It, it's going to re reduce costs when we put the solar panels in. That's correct. It is going to reduce the overall costs, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm presenting it in a way that's confusing and not reflecting that. Um, what I'm trying to get at, I think, more than anything, is the fact that by adding the EV charger, there will be additional costs incurred um, that the Parks Department is not in favor of funding. And there are some months when the solar array would cover those costs and then we wouldn't have to worry about the additional costs but there are some months when we would incur costs and, and i guess we don't know what those costs would be and there there seems to be no projection of what they would be is that right well again kind of getting back to the estimated if we go with the eight hours at the um, assumed use that Jesse provided. I mean, it could be approximately, if the panel's not generating enough per month, approximately $150 per month for the Parks Department to fund. But I don't have exact numbers, and I'm sorry. Okay, I well, I, I think then we need to kind of not rely on those numbers um, or the idea that we... I think it's more of a general, like, what is the spirit of this project? Do we want um, this project to be uh, an energy saving project for the city, for the taxpayers of the city, and then that's it? Um, do we want it to be a showcase where we have people interact with kind of that solar energy by charging their cars there? Um, or, and that would be at a cost to the taxpayers. You know, definitely they, the savings would go away if we were allowing um, people to use that charging station at no cost. Um, or do we want some kind of a, a hybrid where people pay to use a charging station at a city park? So I think we have kind of three options there, right? Yeah, that sounds right to me. Okay. Um, um, 
and I can see the point of saying we don't want to be giving away basically um, everybody's taxpayer savings to a few individuals who might use that. I can definitely see where that, you know, there's an argument to be made for that. Um, but I am curious uh, what the commission thinks about having it be for use. I mean, the, the project was going to be, it was advertised, frankly, as we were going to have people charging their cars at Light Park and, and kind of tied with the idea that we were generating energy there. So I, I don't know, do, do other people think that we should do a paid version of this where people, you know, they just fuel up, but they pay the net rate to use the electricity? I, I'd be open to that. I don't know if there's, there's negatives. I haven't thought about that long enough to, to consider all the negatives to that. And I will be quiet now. Um, uh, Randy. Thanks. Yes. Um, actually, I think, I think it, uh, uh, we might get a lot of pushback if people find out that we're, you know, uh, a taxpayer's dime is being paid for someone else's fuel. You know, I mean, just think if it was, we were letting people gas up for free, uh, certain people. Um, but I don't know that we need to charge a going rate. I think we could make it uh, uh, a lower amount where the city isn't uh, giving it away, but we're not, we're, but we're still low enough that we're encouraging people to use it that were the energy and the idea uh it'd be uh and what that would be i don't know we'd have to kind of it's going to take a uh, more mathematical mind to mind to figure that out but i i think we just need some kind of nominal fee uh that encourages people but it also you know we're, we're not just giving it away to these few select people oh so that's my thoughts I don't know if we can outcompete the private market, though. I think there might be some issues with that. Just, just curious about that. Do we have a private market here that's that's uh, selling uh, electricity to cars? There's the charging station. Yeah. Or charging here. WPS. I think Fest does Festival have one. Yep, Festival. Okay, charge, do this one. Is that? that? Do we know how much they are charging at those, if any? Yep, I'm the one who actually set up the uh, the price structure. It's free for the first three hours, and it's five dollars per hour after that. I've also had some swipe key. You could the city could get a cut of the per kilowatt charge. Yeah, I would. I would just add that I I definitely think we should charge something. I don't. I don't think that this should be, um, especially for city residents, a way to avoid perhaps what they normally would have paid and the expectation that they would have paid something with the purchase, their purchase of an electric car as sort of a site to charge instead of at home, uh, assuming that they, they have access to that. And I think the other value in this is, is both an educational tool uh, which is why I think I, I like the idea of moving forward towards that as, all, as well as an additional marketing tool for the city of Green Bay to say, this is our EV charging map. We've got availability. Um, if you're coming to town with an EV or a chargeable vehicle, and here's just one more site that we've got. But yeah, I don't think it should be free. Also, if it's free get a lot of abuse people are going to park their cars there for too long you know even after it's done charging it'll still be sitting there that's preventing other people then from being able to use it could we also i'm fine with the this, this is very interesting the whole charging thing and paying for it um what about also maybe looking for opportunities to install more, more solar Yes, or, or Julie, are you saying with, with the money 
instead of putting in EV, just turn that into more solar panels? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, 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 to produce more solar energy at that site so that we can have maybe more EV stations or, or produce more energy maybe. If it's going to be at a cost, then maybe we can look for opportunities to boost up the lower the cost by producing more solar energy. And Corey, I don't want to pile on on you, you know, but what the hell, you know. <laughs> um, I, I, part of your discussion, your logic is is in terms of the energy usage, but um, if you don't, you know, your your cost of energy was higher in the past with the old solar panels and it's going to be lower now because the solar panels are providing more energy so your actual cost for operation of that park should have gone down over or will go down over time with new solar panels right so the actual i mean the actual budget for that park within the park's budget and i i'm, I'm pretty good at budgeting um is is less so i mean you know, an argument saying that we shouldn't uh, put an EV panel or EV charger in there is probably not a, not as strong as you'd like as you think because you've got a cost savings already there from new solar panels that are providing more energy than the old solar panels, so your cost of operating are, is lower. There is that differential there. You can't look at the energy usage exactly and, and determine it. We don't have enough data over time, but you certainly have cost of usage over time and you know what your, your bills have been for the last five, six, seven, 10 years uh, for electrical usage. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, I think having an EV charger there is, is, a, is definitely a benefit to the park in general. Um, uh, I think you know, it'll take a while to figure out exactly what those costs are. You don't have enough, we just don't have enough information yet to really make sure make a good analysis of that but I think uh, you know at, at the end of the day I think that charger will get use and I think yeah I'm I I'm with with um, Cody that there are uh, you know I, I run my operation is is for lack of a better term for profit our waste hauling is is you know we charge we compete with the private sector all the time um, and we do it because if we we don't undercut because if we did, we, you know, there, there are other issues that arise, but it's not politically advisable and, um, uh, but you can do it and, and, and it keeps the market fairly stable, but it encourages others to look at it as well. And that's, that's a big thing for us. You know, at some point you, you're looking at, does this go from public to private um, and encourage larger private usage or private development? So, you know, I'm, I'm all for, Charging something, trying to look at the market in terms of what the charges are. I'm guessing Cody's done an analysis of all that. You're, you didn't just pull five bucks an hour out of the, the air someplace. You know, <laughs> there's something else in there. Uh, but I think that's worth it. Um, you know, I don't know what the, I don't, I don't own electric vehicles, so I've never pl had to plug in and figure out what it goes for. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd, I'd support that in that terms of, yep put it in and, and do some cost recovery with it. Um, there's a couple things to consider before moving forward. First of all, um, I think it's important for the commission to consider whether or not the parks department, this is, this is in the parks department's purview. Just because the solar array is at Light Park, does it mean that the parks department is in the business of EV generation? especially for vehicles. So that's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is the cost of, a, of an actual charging station. Um, I, don't, I mean, maybe there's some sort of app, <laughs> you get a code, I, I don't know, where, which, where you wouldn't have to actually have um, a, a credit card meeting machine. Um, I'm not really 100% sure, but there are costs obviously associated with installing a way for people to pay. Seems like there's some conversation around, and here's JB. Uh, Do you guys want an actual EV user who's dealt with a campus planning perspective on this? Just sure. for a couple pointers. Move to open the floor. Yes, so we have to open the floor. 
So I've been, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, okay. hold on, hold on. I, I can too. turn my video off, but I, I, there, there are a couple things I, couple EV resources I could just point you towards if the floor is open. Hold on one I'll second. I'll mute until y'all decide. Okay. I have a motion to open the floor. Sorry, Seth. And a yeah. second. Second. Second by Randy. Second All by present. Randy. Open the Close floor. In favor. Say aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay. All right. The floor is open. And you have to give your name and address, JB. Okay. Do you want, do you want my, my local Northeast Wisconsin address or the, or the other? The Whichever one? address you choose. <laughs> Hi, Julie Beth Hines, um, 3522 Udall Street in San Diego, California. So, and nice to meet you all. Um, a couple things from a longtime EV owner and user. Um, also, I'm faculty, as Celestine will tell you later, at UC San Diego, which has a big fleet of different EV chargers. Um, having available chargers in public places is incredibly encouraging to people when you see that you know if you're taking your kids there and you know you can charge up or top off very encouraging to electric vehicle use um the best platform generally in terms of usability and consistency nationally right now is called charge point um, that has the largest user community, probably the best app. Um, although there's another app to check out called EV, how most EV users figure out where they can go, et cetera. Um, there is a company called Volta that puts free chargers in a lot of shopping malls. I don't know the financials that they work out, but free chargers encourage what we call stall napping. When you go in and you bin and you disappear, um, the paper charger is generally the expectation of an EV driver. You expect to poke your swipe card for blinker or charge point and to pay something. Um, the rates vary dramatically by shopping center, by leave or can get a cut, can help negotiate what rate is ch charged. And, and then so, so I've paid three bucks for four hours at UCSD to $2 for a half hour at the mall. But I will say that um, in communities where EV chargers are not as widely used as here, I'm thinking of Oxford, Mississippi off the top of my head, um, starting to put them in is a really good signal to people that this is coming. Um, and then somebody will park a Tesla there and everybody goes and checks it out. So um, I hope that those are helpful insights. I just, those, until I bought an EV, I had concept. Uh, but it's wonderful to hear that Green Bay is considering that installation at a, such a prominent place. And then JB, your app, do you pay for it through that app? Um, you yeah, you reload your, it's like a Starbucks card. You reload your ah, card. Okay. Um, or if it gets low, I think, I think charge point automatically refills below 25 bucks blink. I think I poke it. Um, and then you have a, a key tag that goes on your car keys and you beep, and you can also call and do a pay per. I think the only limitation really is cash that, that I don't know of an EV system that takes any kind of cash payment. Um, thanks for that um, insight. Anything else, sir? We can have a motion to close the floor again. Motion to close the floor. By Randy, is there a second? Second. By Ned. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Time out. Celestine, you're on mute. <laughs> so wait, Randy made the motion to close and who seconded it? 
uh, Ned. Although I saw Mark Waven. <laughs> we'll give Mark that one. And yeah. close the floor. Um, All right, and then, okay, I'm ready, go ahead. Cool, all right, other uh, floor closed. Other thoughts, comments? I guess I would like to start thinking about emotion. Um, it sounds like there are some logistical issues that wouldn't be able to be handled right now. Um, it sounds like there might be some uh, kind of concerns departmentally that maybe would take a while to, to work through and address and see, you know, who should be responsible for what. Um, but it also feels like the majority of the commission is interested in at least exploring the idea of a pay for use at light park. Um, so I don't know if the appropriate motion here would be to hold things over for a month, but maybe I'll, I'll seek guidance from Celestine or that's what, what would you, I'd be glad to make that motion if, it seems like we could get some work done in between meetings. No? Celestine is saying absolutely not. All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I also want to make sure, listen, we'll, we'll get to this when we get to the resiliency coordinator. Um, we have a couple, so we have to wrap up with JB um, and the code audit work and mount an election in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I had hoped we would have, well, I'll talk about the resiliency coordinator later. I would, I, you know, had we been able to move forward with our plans, I would say, yep, let's start exploring this right now. Um, given everything, I, yeah. I do not have that bandwidth. Sorry. I think the only thing we could do right now is kill the whole thing. I don't think we can do anything else with, like thinking so, through everything hold, else. So holding it makes sense. Holding it, I would hold it into November your November meeting, which would be, um, hold on one second. The November meeting is November 11th. Do we want to do it in November or December? I am fine personally pushing it to December if November 11th is too soon after all that work people have been doing on the election. <laughs> what election? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to make the motion to hold this over to our December meeting. Okay. Sounds. Like second. Also, my two cents, that sounds great. All right, motion by Ned, second by John. All those in favor? Wait, 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 wait. I'd, I'd just like to make a comment before, though. Um, I mean, there's a lot to go through, and I support holding it. But I mean, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand Park's full argument about why they wouldn't be, I mean, they're reaping the benefit of this. It's their bills that are going down that they pay for. And at all parks, uh, they're responsible for what's in the park. So I don't know what the hesitancy is on parks part, except for if we put in the EV without, you know, uh, charging, I can see that's an issue. But other than that, um, I'm not sure uh, what the concern is for parks as far as the whole project goes. So I would like to, going forward, I would like to hear that full argument so I can better understand that. Well, and I, I guess I should clarify that all of the work has been completed except for the addition of the EV charger. Mm -hmm. So I, we are in support, yes, of, of you know the array itself and, and the savings for the cost of the department, but, um, you know, last I had spoke with staff, we weren't in support of paying fees incurred from the use of the EB charger. Um, but I understand, you know, going back to some of the comments Mark made and things like that, yes, there is a savings, so how can that tie in? And um, so I guess I just wanted to make sure that the array has been, panels have been updated and um, it's really just the EB charger yet that's in question. Okay, but if we if we're charging though, then that should help alleviate that concern. Yeah. There is there more to it? Um, you mean if we're? I'm sorry. What do you mean by if we're charging? If we're charging? If we're, char if we're if, if 
the EV use isn't free if it, there's a cost. I mean, oh, that way, yes. I think um, if if we're charging for the use of the EV charger, I don't think there would be as much concern. Ah, okay. All right. I wasn't sure if there was something else. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Was that, was that an unintentional pun from Randy? I think that's a <laughs> charge. All I got to say is I get a charge out of charging. There we go. You we got him going. For so. our gene, and I think we should wait, charge. Wait, wait, see, what, what, what? See, I can mute you. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, can I ask, is there anything else that we should think about between now and December besides just the cost of using? Is there something else that's kind of like that we don't know about, like, you know, uh, repair costs or something that we're not considering that we should consider? No, mainly I think it's really just the consumption costs of anything above what the solar panel wouldn't cover. If does that okay. make sense? So I talk that. I'm oh. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. No, I, I just assume between now and then, um, if Corey can talk with the the people who are concerned in park, and if that addresses it, then we can hear about that in in December. Yeah, that I was going to echo that, that I think that, Corey, I think it would be important to have a conversation with the director, um, Director Ditchai, just to make sure that this is something that he feels is in the wheelhouse of the Parks Department, even if there is charging, uh, even if there is a cost that will be borne by the user to avoid a pun. Yeah, and Director Ditchai did already share with me that he would be open to discussion about if it were a paste in. Okay. So. Awesome. So right now we have a motion on the floor the to. Thing, is that the only thing, the only reason we're holding this? What are the other reasons for holding this? No one to work on it. Oh, well, okay. That's a good one. <laughs> I, I also think, Randy, it would give us some time to research some of the companies that JB brought up or um, how, you know, how we want to roll it out even like, how do others do other cities use an app? I have no idea. This is brand new for Green Bay. So. Mm -hmm. When it was just going to be a free plug in your car thing, there were less, I think, moving parts to this whole scenario. Mm -hmm. Great. So the motion is to hold until the December meeting. Mm -hmm. There's a motion from Ned. Was there a second? Yes, there was from John Arndt. Side. From John. All right. So, all those in favor of that, say aye. aye. Or aye. 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 And all those opposed. All right. Cool. We'll uh, we'll revisit this in a few months. Moving to consideration with possible action on the progress of. The Green Infrastructure Code Audit Planning Consultant. So, motion to open the floor. Uh, the motion to open the floor. Randy, second. Bye. I'll second. By Mark. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. And we're open for business. All right. Okay. Well, I'll put that screen up. Just give me one second, JB. One second. Oh, okay. I love it when my computer cooperates with me. All right, let's see if I can make this a little bit better. No, I can't, <laughs> so sorry. Is that, can everybody see that well enough? Let me try it again, hold on. The 
Give me one second. There we go. That is way better. How about that? All right, JV, you're okay. Great. Well, um, I'll, I'll reintroduce myself. Um, thanks for letting me expound on, on electric vehicles briefly, though. Um, but I'm Julie Beth Hines. I go by JB. Um, and I've really been delighted to be working with Celestine and with Corey over the last couple of months and with the Stormwater team on a, a look through the city's codes and ordinances and practices around our most common types of green infrastructure that we that we use in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, I have worked as Julia is very I have had the privilege of working with Julia on different aspects of green infrastructure and resiliency um, for several years now, and she um, she's been an amazing colleague. And one of the things that she, that we worked on with C Grant was sort of a report card format that communities could use to look at where their written and their unwritten codes and practice so the codes and also practices are supporting green infrastructure, perhaps a barrier to green infrastructure, and, and what we can do to um, get past that. And it's mostly, I would say that this process is really about looking for ways to ensure that green infrastructure practices, things that are beneficial for water quality are fully enabled, are, um, if not top of mind, at least, you know, put on an equal footing with conventional management strategies like ponds or underground detention. Um, and that we're using, that, that local codes and communities are referring to the best practice standards, um, especially technical standards and definitions that are in use, um, you know, not just in, not just locally, but, but Wisconsin-wide that have been really sort of thoroughly vetted. So I have had um, two, com two in-depth conversations now with um, engineering, with Public Works and Stormwater with Celestine, um, and a couple also with planning and zoning, community development. And then with Corey, who's been an awesome resource, just understanding um, the city standards and specifications, comfort level with different landscaping practices, et cetera. So what you see here is um, kind of a summary. It's kind of a report card. And um, on some key areas of Green Bay's code where there are some issues and opportunities for some of our basic green infrastructure practices. Um, so it, Celestine, I think probably it's most useful if I just walk through these a little bit. Um, yes, I, I mean, this is really because... good. Sorry, this is really good information. I think it would be, you know, given um, the what kind of changes it's going to make for us, I think it'd be really great to really walk through each one of these um, in a fairly substantive okay. manner. Okay, and if you all have questions, please Yelp. Um, I can only see the active speaker because I'm on my iPad because my computer gets an epic fail for not letting me into Zoom and apologies for all the email. Um, so if you have a question, please interrupt at will. Um, so let's start with the stormwater ordinance, chapter 30 of the code. So that is you know, pursuant to our MS4 municipal storm sewer system permit um, and Wisconsin um, NR216 requires the city to at least a sub subset of projects, those generally adding half an acre of impervious or disturbing an acre or more, must implement certain practices both for flood control and for water quality. Um, and Green Bay's Chapter 30 is compliant with, it's basically compliant with the state minimum. Um, there are communities in Wisconsin that require water quality treatment for smaller areas of impervious, for say adding even down to 5,000 square feet, um, for disturbing smaller areas. Re 
recommending a lower threshold immediately gets into the issues of cost imposition on redevelopment in particular, but development in general. Um, where there is a definite opportunity to improve the ordinance um, without touching that very, very difficult threshold issue, three things. One is to add definitions of green infrastructure practices that are in what we call the Wisconsin um, conservation you know, technical practice standards for things like permeable pavement tension, vegetated swales. Right now, the only technical standard referred to is a pond. Um, it doesn't mean that an applicant couldn't you know, use biofiltration. In fact, many have, but we're not saying so explicitly. So if you're a consulting engineer reading the stormwater ordinance, what it says to you is, if you design a pond this way, you'll get your permit. If you use green infrastructure, Structure, it doesn't say no, but it doesn't say how that's going to be evaluated for compliance. So a very, very simple but very powerful thing to do is to just add in that green that the following practices following Wisconsin DNR post construction technical standards are accepted under this section of the ordinance. Um, another thing that sounds simple but isn't done, and I've, I've seen a lot of success where this integration is made, is to um, ask applicants for stormwater, for approval under Chapter 30, to, to include not only a grading plan that sh and, and the stormwater management plan, but to add the proposed landscape plan to that sheet. And what that does, doesn't cost it, it shows Okay, are we creating, it's, it's, a, it's a way to look at whether vegetated areas um, can be used to manage stormwater. Um, it's a way to look for, for potentially adverse planting. And it simply puts two different information um, on the same sheet so that as your team, as Met Heckenleibel and his team are reviewing this, they can look for opportunities, they can look for potential problems. Um, again, it's a no cost request, it's just click the extra CAD piece and pull that into the stormwater plan and then we see how our landscape and trees and our, and our stormwater management um, can work together. So those are really the basic changes that I would I, I will, I'm drafting and will recommend that Matt and his team consider for chapter 30 on the stormwater ordinance itself. Questions, comments, barbed remarks on that one. May I ask a question? I don't, sorry, if somebody else had their hand up, go ahead. <laughs> no, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I like the, um, the bottom part of book. I like all of these. These are things that cities have been doing for a long time that we really definitely need to, to ramp up. Um, can you, can you speak a little more and maybe, maybe it just, I didn't catch it all, but the landscaping at the bottom there, mm -hmm. um, the revisions to the, where, where we get a grade of D, um, what, yeah. what did, what were the barriers and, and can, I don't know, I can't read below. Um, it says substantial barriers to the integration of uh, vegetated stormwater management. Thank you. Yep. And I mean, she was going through one at a time. So we were just at the t very top one with stormwater. Okay. Thank you. And then she started talking about landscaping because she, it, it's recommended that we connect the stormwater planning with the landscaping planning. Right. And that last asterisk, just so you know, I just wanted to. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay. So we'll get more to the landscape. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to make sure I have that right in front of me. So, but on stormwater, these are, these aren't earth shaker changes, um, but they're important. It's really important to tell your applicant community, use the DNR technical standards, and you're good to go. 
you know, we, we will issue an approval on that. Um, if I just moving down the system, we will, we will definitely get to landscaping on erosion control. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why there are in fact two repetitions of the erosion control standards that are nearly identical. Um, that's something that if there were recodification, you'd probably want to fix. Um, 34, and then it's also in chapter 13, division 11. Fundamentally, it's, it's a, it's a standard erosion control ordinance. Um, I think it meets probably the requirement from DNR, but the, um, a couple of things that in, in, especially in conversations, um, are clear that they're perhaps not being as rigorously as they could be. Um, and there are two other pieces that I would recommend. Um, I know Northeast Wisconsin well, um, and the soils and the types of construction practices going on. Um, when you get, say, a plat for development at the edge of, towards the edge of the city, how you treat those former farm soils during construction um, can have a big impact on whether the lawns and the green spaces infiltrate at all after they're built. Um, if you get construction equipment driving all over the place, you're gonna compact those soils. Um, so even when you put the sod down, it's, it's not likely to have as much um, water absorbing function as it could. And if you don't really protect mature trees, um, identify them and then protect them during construction, you lose a lot of them. And with the prevalence of flooding issues in and around Green Bay, this becomes important. Every foot that you keep functional um, can help reduce that total flood risk that the city has, which is significant. So I would recommend, and this I think, um, there were concerns from DPW about politically, is this really something that they, they feel okay about? Um, but something that doesn't cost anything to a developer to add to a plan or to do during construction. One is to use your pink or your yellow tape and stake out the limits of disturbance um, before you start construction so that the drivers of the excavators and the trucks and such have a visual barrier, have a barrier there so they don't drive into that area or stockpile stuff. And that we find, and there's, there's good evidence of the protectiveness of this um, from a lot of other studies. It's just, don't drive here. You're, that That is an area that's a limit of disturbance. Um, same goes for the drip line of any mature tree. Fencing that off with snow fencing. Again, this is not, nothing you aren't already buying for your construction site. Fence off that drip line of the mature trees. Uh, it has a material impact on their likelihood of survival and their protection during construction. Um, I, I sense that there could be some concerns from DPW about adding that as a requirement. Um, I always encourage communities to, you know, in a pre-construction inspection, um, to make sure that those erosion control BMPs are in place and make sure that those Mark, demarcations are inspected. You know, that's something that I think DPW didn't feel great about having to impose on builders, but again, it's a no cost issue. It's, it's a couple more rolls of tape. It has a big impact on soil health and, and performance. Um, I would also encourage consideration of adopting an erosion control guide, similar to what we've used in Vermont, for low risk sites um, and getting that information out more widely. Um, we, I, I will send around a resource called the Low Risk Construction Erosion Handbook that we've used very successfully in Vermont that just starts to orient people towards ways that they can 
prevent soil trespass and prevent compaction. And again, stressing the link, the, the link that, that that can have to flooding um, and, and damage, I think would be a good step um, for you as a sustainability commission to, to think about. Questions on erosion control. I have a question. Um, as far as, you know, you mentioned um, checking in on construction sites as the construction is happening. Is that something you would propose writing into the ordinance or is that just another kind of aspect of what would happen after, you know, during construction, I guess? <laughs> um, I got the impression and, and Celestine can, you know, correct me if I was wrong, that there isn't a lot of appetite for construction inspection in general. Um, and there is a feeling that that would, would perhaps be a challenge with the, the, the building community. Um, cities are all over the map on this. And, and I will say that it really depends on um, overall approaches to enforcement. Um, even Madison, doesn't do a lot with ensuring that, for example, landscape plans have been planted and are surviving. They're doing some work on that right now. Um, we have other communities in Wisconsin that go out and count every shrub and make absolutely sure that there are three check-ins during construction for erosion control and that all the plant material is planted as plant and is surviving. Um, Franklin is particularly um, invested in those inspections. Brookfield does a, a heck of a good job on that too. Um, but it really varies. And uh, I think it's a, it's a question. In my experience, and for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I spent 12 years um, as a community development and stormwater director. And that post, that construction check-in, post-construction check-in, is where we solved a lot of problems. There's a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth about, well, I just want these trees and I don't like my plant anyway. But consistently visiting those sites, looking at the plans during construction, post-construction, um, is really how you make, how you build better habits around erosion control and certainly around landscape and green infrastructure function and survival. So it, it's, a, it's a lift, it's a, it's a different orientation for staff and for your applicants. So I guess then enforcement isn't necessarily something that becomes part of the ordinance. It's really just how the city is, um, decides to approach it and it's not necessarily part of the ordinance. Is that right? It can be. Okay. Um, I have drafted and enforced ordinances that are rigid, rigidly specify when certain things will occur in order to get a certificate of compliance. Um, I don't always recommend, I, I have one community that has a provision that every site shall be inspected within 24 hours of a one inch storm. You know, is somebody really out of compliance if the rain gauge was off or somebody was out of town and it gets a little too difficult, but the, it can be in an ordinance. Um, again, direction from DPW didn't lead me that way. I can show you what it would look like um, to put those provisions into code where, you know, the, the, it is an actual code requirement with enforceability. Okay, and I guess I just want to make the point that I'm not necessarily suggesting that I'm just trying to get a better understanding of how it works right now. Absolutely. So the next one on here is definitions, and this gets back to the chapter 30. Um, Julia is uh, painfully familiar with some of the standard definitions for green infrastructure that um, 
a lot of Wisconsin municipalities have been adopting. It's the idea is to keep it consistent with those DNR technical standards so that if you're looking for what's the definition of bioretention, it's not only consistent between your zoning, um, you know, your, your zoning ordinance and your stormwater ordinance, but also consistent with those DNR technical standards so that people actually know what you mean by bioretention. Um, I need to check in Celestine with community development and Matt on which code should it go in or both? Because some communities are happier to keep all the definitions in one place. Some want it repeated in two places. Um, but that's a, and again, this is not imposed cost or requirement, but you'd be shocked at how much of a help it is to applicants and staff doing plan review to know what the definition of um, permeable surfacing is and where to find a technical standard. So that is a very strong recommendation. And um, we need to figure out where to put that. On um, architectural design, this one is, you know, Green Bay does not have any apparent conflicts. Um, the only thing I see, and, and this is a common issue, is easy fix, is to make sure that there's no question that a rain barrel or rainwater harvesting, something like a storm garden system that we're seeing a lot of around Milwaukee, um, would be permitted to what we call encroach into the setback. So it would be allowable between the front building line of your house and the sidewalk. Um, sheds are not. Um, so you wanna make sure that anything that's a structure is specifically exempted from that so that you can have those green infrastructure features where the water is. Um, so that's a simple fix in 13509. I don't see any other conflicts with the city's building design that would preclude use of things like a green roof, um, foundation planter boxes, et cetera. That was the only thing I saw um, that was even remotely challenging for, for actual building design. Got plenty of places where we have, we have big issues with architectural standards. Um, any questions on that? Okay. So the big area, and don't get put off by the D, um, the big area where there's a, sort of an active conflict between how sites are planned and regulated in your codes and our green infrastructure practices, particularly um, anything vegetated, bioretention, biofiltration, is the landscape standards. And these are in the zoning code. Um, which it's so the specific reference, if you want to look at it, is section 13.1820 of chapter 13, and then 18.21, 22, 23, 24. Um, I have to say that when I started in on this project um, and started reading the zoning ordinance, um, I've a lot of Wisconsin communities that have plenty of resources have not bothered to update their site plan review standards since ooh, 1968, 69, 73 maybe. And Green Bay made an investment a few years ago in a really well-written zoning code. Um, it is modern, it is readable, it is, um, it reflects best practices for reducing parking. Often I spend a lot of time, you know, picking apart how many parking spaces are required or giant drive through lanes. None of that is in Green Bay's code. You've got a very well put together zoning code. Um, and it, the steps that we would, that I often have to recommend to, you know, reduce the size of parking lots are already done and they're built into this code, which is a real credit to the city um, and the community development group to have taken that step. So it's an excellent zoning code. The one challenge for stormwater and green infrastructure, and this is common and it's not wrong or bad, is um, in Kevin's words, Green Bay was originally French and we like our shrubs in a row and we like our trees and we like our hostas. 
And when you're trying to do bioretention design, that just that aesthetic um, and the requirement for, you know, one canopy tree per parking lot island, those things conflict. And what we see is to meet the, the parking lot perimeter and the perimeter landscape buffer standards and the foundation planning standards, you could not design those areas as stormwater management zones. They basically have to be curbed irrigated landscape areas. So this again is not, there, you know, the impulses to have more landscaping are all good, but I'm working with um, my, my partner in crime and we're gonna be recommending some pretty substantive changes to section to that section 13.18. Um, some of the things that we have found in landscape design, the wider the perimeter buffer, the more likely it is that the plants, especially bioretention, survive snow and salt. Um, trees do not do well planted in small parking lot islands. It's far better instead of one tree in an island every 10 spaces, far better to put um, make it one bigger island and give the trees enough soil volume that you actually get some, some canopy function um, instead of committing arborside with small islands and, and a tree that just doesn't have enough soil there to function. Um, foundation landscaping, the language right now, it says it has to be ornamental plant material and we can't use that that area, if it has to be ornamental plant material, that means we can't do a planter box, can't do biofiltration. Um, so there's, there's some simple changes that we will be making in there. Um, that can be a little hard to wrap heads around for people who are used to reviewing site plans and landscape plans a certain way. So I think that'll be, you know, the bigger lift for the rest of my work with, with this project. Questions on landscape. I think with the landscaping and kind of relating back to the stormwater management, um, will, there be, will, will there be recommendations for like di different types of vegetation? So like say, um, you know, is vegetation just vegetation? So is, is a turf grass area equal to an area planted with trees? Or, you know, will there be kind of defined or recommendations regarding this? Yes. Yeah, I think, um, what I can say, I wish I could screen share tonight. Um, what we usually do is write in, right now under, I'm looking at 13.1824. And JB, says, yes. JB, do you want me to make you a co-host so you can screen share? No, because I'm on my, Celestine, thank you, but I'm on my iPad because my computer is why I couldn't log oh, in. Oh, okay. All right. Feeling great about the technology tonight. Um, right now, you've got shrubs, evergreen trees, ornamental deciduous, deciduous. We'd probably rework that list into canopy, evergreen, flowering or ornamental, um, woody shrubs, evergreen shrubs, and then native forbs and grasses, bioretention plantings. And just again, it's adding those in gives your applicants much more flexibility of how do I provide enough landscape to meet these regulations. It also says, okay, I could design this area for bioretention by using these native grasses, um, rather than being limited to five gallon shrub, an evergreen tree, an ornamental deciduous. Um, and it then gets, Corey, to your important point that we can say, you know, limit the amount of area that can be turf grass, although I think your group has been doing a pretty good job requiring um, things other than turf to be integrated into landscape. I think I would just add just that this particular section is really important because it's, um, it gives it the opportunity to combine landscaping with stormwater management 
and which is a big cost savings in general because everyone's going to be paying for landscaping no matter what. So why not uh, leverage the site and, you know, and put in stormwater management at the same time too. Yep. So that's um, that's the, that, that is the section that you'll you'll see the most surgery on. Um, parking again. I, hats off to Green Bay. You have really well updated parking standards ratios, shared parking. Anything we'd recommend is done. So that is that is great. Permeable materials. Um, it's. I, I think we would add. A sentence 13.1714 on 1714. Where are you? 13. Point. Your off street parking section in the zoning code. Um, I don't think you have a barrier because right now your surfacing language just says well, number one, you allow driveways to have a grass center, which is great. Um, and two, your all off street parking and driveways need a dustless, all-weather hard surface. You don't have a limitation. I might recommend adding a sentence to that that says permeable pavement systems that meet the DNR technical standard um, you know, are an acceptable surfacing material. And that wouldn't be changing your code. It would just, again, refer back to that technical standard um, so that people know to use that. But your your DPW engineering team is, as they're knowledgeable about permeable surfacing, they're really interested in seeing how that could help with flooding. Um, you have a <clears throat> peer community to the south and west that has much bigger issues with the use of permeable surfacing than Green Bay does. So um, I think that's great. That's often something I spend a lot of time on and it, you're, you're in pretty good shape there. Um, one area that this again could be it could feel controversial but it's really important to water quality it's not a green infrastructure thing but if we think of our whole system as being part of our green infrastructure um and again this is very common right now your your zoning ordinance site plan standards require trash and dumpster areas to have three-sided screening what we often see is the dumpster areas get put right on top of the storm drain because then they drain really well, right? But the problem is we get seagulls, raccoons, trash, we get dumpster juice. And when that's plopped on top of, you know, a separate storm drain, or if it's curved and graded so that it runs off into surface water, um, we get a direct discharge of pollutants. Julie, remember that up in Superior when we basically could follow the funky stuff into um, Lake Superior from one of the restaurants because the dumpsters were getting washed out right on top of a storm drain. So a really good habit to build into site plan review is to require not only that you have a locking four-sided enclosure and covers on the dumpsters, keep out the seagulls and such, but that those areas are curbed or drained to direct the runoff away from a storm drain inlet and away from surface waters. Um, that can be to a lawn area. It can be towards the edge of a stormwater pond. Anything but a direct discharge into your surface water or your storm drain. Um, and that, again, this is not a cost thing, but it's a, when it becomes a habit, you prevent a lot of problems. I didn't even realize that you we had talked about this you know jb and i had talked about it and so i was going on one of the walks you know it, i live in an area where there's a lot of redevelopment there's a lot of dumpsters right over storm drains i didn't even notice that before so yeah, yeah. and and there may there are going to be cases where there's like nothing you can do but there are a lot of cases where you can um you know, and when you're doing redevelopment, 
partly because it's a site amenity, especially like a residential redevelopment, you're gonna encase, in all likelihood, somebody's gonna figure out how to encase the trash areas. Just grade it away from the drains. And it, it really, we had an entire, when I was a, a planning director, we had a swimming beach that was chronically closed. Lo and behold, it wasn't a leaking sanitary sewer, it was the trash behind the Kmart. And once that area was cleaned up, graded and drained away, we stopped getting beach closures there. And um, Provincetown, Massachusetts out on the Cape has been putting permeable, they've got nowhere to go with the, the restaurant trash, but they've been putting permeable pavements underneath so that there's a layer of treatment. They've had improved water quality and reduced beach closures. And that was, that's another really big success story on that front. So it's a fairly simple fix. Again, not adding cost, but um, I'd love to see Green Bay take that step. Um, natural lawns, I think there, there's just a few minor clarifications on that that Celestine and I have talked about. Um, and, you know, the, and otherwise, it's, it's a good ordinance. It's a very solid approach to enabling people to do a, a natural landscape or lawn provision. And your noxious weed ordinance is up to date. So kind of like being up to date on your shots for your dog. So um, the subdivision code, it's old. Um, your community development group knows that. Way past my scope to rewrite it, but when it's done, there'll be a lot of opportunities there. Um, any support that they can get for an allocation to get that subdivision ordinance cleaned up would be awesome. Um, Downspout disconnection, it does not appear to me that there are any issues, though I do want to check one thing with, with Matt about that. Okay. So I see Ned has his experts with him. Um, I, I just wanted to say, JB, that this is great. I mean, as an ex-planner, yeah. <laughs> uh, Here, see, I've got my expert. <laughs> as an ex-planner ex and, and, and the garbage guy for the county, you know, yeah, everything you hit on is set on is is spot on. I mean, that's yep. you know, it, as uh, my department at the county handles all the solid waste in the county. And we don't want water in anything. We don't want our, you know, we call it, it's not garbage juice, it's leachate, but you know, hey, yeah. uh, everybody's got their own terms. Um, we don't want to have to pay to, to deal with that liquid. You know, in fact, our, our rules and regs say no free water, no, uh, no free waters within garbage cans typically or dumpsters are, you know, allowed. And so there's a lot of that within our, uh, the, the county code on, on solid waste as well, so. Probably ties in with that and may actually strengthen what you're looking mm -hmm. at with the city of Green Bay. So. Yeah, that's yeah. great to know. Yeah, that's great. And, and are you going to, Celestine, are we going to get a copy of this grid as it stands right now? Now, just to take a look at and think about it a little more? I, sure, I can send it out as, um, yeah, I can send it to you. Okay. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just remind myself to do that. I'll remind you. There you go. Other questions and reactions? I mean, this is a lot of work. We've had really good meetings. We still have a couple more to go. Um, mm -hmm. And the pandemic, you know, didn't help, uh, doesn't help. Yep. But uh, all the conversations have been really, I think, very fruitful and challenging. Um, and in that way, encouraging, I would say as well. The one thing that before Ned, I think you have some comments. The one thing I wanna make sure everybody is aware of in our original grant, and Julia knows this as does JB. Um, in our original grant, we talked a lot about uh, the Oneida Intergovernmental Agreement and also the comprehensive plan. And basically using the Green Infrastructure Code Audit, uh, and rolling some of these, the, the ideas and, um, you know, certainly some of the uh, changes up into our agreement with the Oneida, as well as with our comp plan. 
Um, just uh, to recap, the Oneida, because of the pandemic, had to close down their casino operations, mm -hmm. which meant that they had no revenue, which meant that we don't have an agreement with them. Um, the spirit of the agreement still is very much alive, um, but you, you can't have agreement without consideration. So that's on hold for now. Um, as far as the comp plan goes, uh, I think we, we may actually be looking to hire someone for the comp plan to help us with that. You know, we were gonna do it in house. Once again, I think the pandemic really has brought about some challenges for us, um, uh, just in terms of workload and just having to make sure that we're managing everything, managing expectations, changing our workflow, you know, putting things online. So I think that that really has taken up some staff time, to be honest with you. Uh, I believe we are looking at hiring someone to do to help us with the comp plan. I'm not 100% sure about that just yet, but so just wanted to make sure that I'm capturing uh, some of the things that we had talked about in, in reference to mm -hmm. the code audit and the grant, um, and then some of the things that we have to do. I think, honestly, that the other part of the grant that we're really hoping to do, not only just to have uh, a green infrastructure code audit so that we can actually implement green infrastructure, but then also to have some more interdepart interdepartmental cooperation. Yeah. And Corey and JB touch on that a little bit when regarding um, enforcement and uh, compliance at a construction site, uh, like a pre-construction meeting and uh, what's going on at the construction site. And then, uh, but before you even get to construction, a plan review. So I think some of those things are happening, um, not quite at the pace that we had anticipated, but I would say that we're, uh, we're pretty much on target with some of those internal changes that we were looking for uh, with the grant, so. And I also, Celestine, we, there's a lot of room, I think, and, and benefit in Green Bay from as many pilot projects in public locations as you can put together mm -hmm. will be beneficial. Um, just to get people, and I've seen this in a lot of other communities, get people more accustomed to seeing that different aesthetic, um, and different features in different places. I would though say that, you know, again, knowing, knowing the community pretty well, um, if I haven't already, I think I sent them to map, but um, the city of Cudahy, just south of Milwaukee, if you're familiar with Cudahy, it's an older suburb right on the, on the lake. Um, their public works director, has she's a genius and she has spent a lot of time making green infrastructure look okay for Cudahy with mowed grass edges with a fence around the planter box so mm. that it doesn't look like a you know a hippie garden in in the sidewalk um so there are some design approaches she's got a bunch of them that i think would be really well received in Green Bay um, and get you the environmental benefits. That, I think, again, any any support to his team and Corey for integrating some of those ideas would be great. The more permeable pavement applications you do, the better. Um, there have been big advances in terms of the materials, understanding how to do header strips so things don't fail, using blocks instead of certain products that have been iffier. Um, they just build up over time and people start to get more used to it. They start to get more proficient. Your contractors get more proficient. Um, official too. So I, I just have a couple things just listening to you. Um, and thank you very much for doing all this work and stuff. So it's great. Um, I, um, I'm kind of surprised about the aesthetic and the landscaping standards, just living here and driving around. Nothing looks the same anywhere you go, but I guess I could be definitely wrong with the people. <laughs> like different neighborhoods look completely different depending on where you are um, and stuff. So that's just one thing. And then the other thing is really, I think the comp plan is a really, really big opportunity. So if you have any recommendations or suggestions on yep. how we could make sure that this stuff these kind of sustainability or and green infrastructures integrated into that process. 
Absolutely. Are you going to be, is this going to be an RFP? Because, okay, is putting language directly in the request for proposal that says this is a, pri you know, a priority for Green Bay is to explore ways to develop policies that will support, you know, appropriate use of green infrastructure as one of our strategies to address flooding and water quality and community character. Stick it in the RFP and make sure that you get thinking about that in, in the proposals that come to you. Um, it's it can put be that in the future recommendations section yeah. if you have one yeah yep. that'd be good um i mean i could i could give you all sorts of fun things to do in your comp plan um something else that we've done we've just done in bayfield bayfield and bayside um and yes, I do often get them backwards with each other, but Bayfield and Bayside, we did surface water flow path mapping um, that basically shows, based on topography and storm, storm and combined sewers, where does every drop of rain travel across the surface and collect? Um, that is, oh, what did we spend in Bayfield? Bayside, I think we were into the, $20,000 range. You've probably got good GIS data. Um, you could even make that an option in your comp plan RFP, depending on, on what the, or if you can secure some extra funding for that. That's a really powerful way to help people understand how water is traveling through the community. Um, it can also upset some apple carts because then six people, you know, somebody will see it is my neighbor's fault that it's coming through here, but um, I can send a couple PDFs of what that looks like. Might be something to think about for your, your comp plan or another project. I would, I would just like to say thank you. I love talking about this stuff and learning more about it. Um, the native, native plants are a huge passion of mine and um, Corey has been very uh, supportive from the parks department and that some folks and I have done, I think it will cut ahead more cleaner for the urban environment, I suppose. Um, I am uh, curious if, do we have, so is this just a report for us to kind of receive in place on file or are there action steps that we as a commission should be taking um, or could be taking based on this report? So right now, um, JB's work is not yet concluded. Uh, this is an update. Uh, we still have a couple more steps to, to go through. Um, and her report isn't actually part of the packet so uh, right now, I mean, it's verbal, but it isn't, yeah. present, you know, it's presented, but it isn't part of the packet, so. But once she has final recommendations, is it something we could support and move forward Absolutely. to? Absolutely, yeah, that's right. Great, great. I think there's, there will be a recommendation to amend chapter 30, the stormwater ordinance. There'll be, a, there'll be a black line of that, black line of chapter 34, erosion control. Um, an example of a small sites erosion control handbook, and then a black line of Division 5, Section 13.17, which is the trash and dumpsters, 13.18, which is landscaping. And I'm, you know, Corey has been an amazing resource. I am behind on getting this stuff drafted, but it's, it's in progress. Um, I am, I have a landscape architect I work with who helps me with the technicals on that. He's going to take a good look at 13.18 so that it's right. Um, and I'm, I'm plowing through. I've, I've got my nostrils back above water and the, the chin is coming. So hopefully probably two and a half weeks and we'll have everything drafted for you to take a look. I have one more question, and this kind of goes to something Julia mentioned at a meeting last year at some point. We were talking about using um, green infrastructure to mitigate, mitigate some of the flooding we have in some of our neighborhoods. 
Um, mentioned, you know, there are definitely things we should be doing within the city, but also in, in the county and in the region, there's going to need to be some partnership. Um, and I don't know if, if you can share any expertise, you know, as you continue on with your work about how to get those other members on board. Um, because I do, you know, I think Julia had a really good point about that. Yeah, in incredibly. It's, it's essential to get, you know, more of the county and, and your adjacent communities um, thinking that way. I, in Bayfield, there's always been and sort of a, an, an issue of the town surrounds, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bayfield, but the, the town is around the city. The city's tiny, it's a square mile, but the whole uphill is in the town of Bayfield, which is county, um, not a lot of coordination, quite a bit of development in subdivisions and golf courses. And we're working on mapping to try to show these relationships to try to build more coordination and communication around the kinds of upstream actions that are going to be needed if the city to, for the city just to be able to to cope down downstream um mapping is a good way to start that you've got county and which rpc which is your regional commission well, the brown county actually is not part of the Bay Lake Regional Planning Commission. They're not part of Bay Lake. Okay. No. But Brown County has GIS resources. Um, you know, starting starting with the county and, and putting stuff on the map, I have found is probably the single best way to start the conversation. Um, Bay, you know, Bay side, we've been doing some work, including construction on big, like, oversized simplified bioretention with grass over the top for localized flood management. Um, and, and having some brown deer is sort of thinking about doing the same with some medians. Um, we have conversations going on about is it green infrastructure if it doesn't have native plants, if it's just turf grass over engineered soil over a lot of rock. I would say yes, because I think with the storms that we're seeing, um, we got to have that subsurface storage. And I think it's part of our green infrastructure arsenal to, to start thinking that way about, okay, do we just, I, I can send you the, the project report from Bay side with the, these huge excavations, just dug way down, a lot of rock, a lot of engineered soil it just creates capacity without taking away people's yards um, so it's a different kind of green infrastructure investment gonna be it, this will not be a dull area of, of inquiry but cool any other questions or uh, we'll entertain a to close the floor this is all really interesting just, just one question uh is there any movement in the field of architecture of redesigning buildings so that to reduce their carbon footprint is that being codified at all do you know is that even being uh looked at you are you aware of or uh i had a conversation with well anyway don't have to go into that uh so I was just wondering if, if there is movement to make our, our buildings greener, the actual design, and it being codified at all anywhere. Sure. Um, the, the U.S. Green Building Council and the, the leadership in energy efficient design standard, there's tons of work around, um, green, uh, around green buildings. Um, doesn't always sync up exactly with the stormwater green infrastructure. Um, green roof systems are kind of where those two things meet. There is a lot of work, I will say this, there's a lot of work right now on rainwater capture for indoor flushing use in Wisconsin. It's getting easier. Um, that's not carbon footprint, which is what you asked about specifically, but it can be a really good way, especially in downtown redevelopment to um, deal with your stormwater management. It used to be 
just about impossible with the state building code it, folks in Madison, and now they're they're figuring it out, and that's a, that's kind of an exciting development on the building front. Any other questions from folks before we entertain a motion to close the floor? Cool. Well, thank you again for, for the presentation. I, I hope to see all of these uh, recommendations. Yeah. Soon. Thank you. It's been, it's been great fun. I'm really, really delighted to work with all of you. Julia is sick of me, but so I thank her again. <laughs> Motion to close the floor. Motion by Alder Randy. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mark. All those in favor say aye. 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 Celebration react. Just kidding. These are all fun. Cool. All those opposed? Uh, floor closed. Thanks again. Wonderful. Moving on uh, from subcommittees. Need a motion? For this yeah, that, that's an action item, so we need a motion. Yeah. Oh, so we a motion need a, to, we need a motion. To hold, right? Because it's not, it's not finished, so just a motion to hold. Hold until when? Yeah, so. Uh, I expect the work to be finished you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Da, da. I would expect that the latest this would come to council, I'm hoping, would be the November 10th meeting. That's council. So we, we could make a motion to hold um, until the October meeting. That would make sense to me. Okay, so just hold to our next meeting. Okay. Cool. Motion to hold until October meeting. Is there a second? Second. We'll second by Ned. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Staffed? Okay. Cool. And hold on one second, Mr. This, Seth. This isn't. The, this is and just now we got the informational. Okay, go ahead. Updates from the committees. Cool. Uh, do we have any uh, updates from uh, subcommittees or any other activities happening, folks aware? I'll just share that uh, really quickly that um, kind of what Ned was talking about. Uh, the, there's a project that's been funded through the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program and the Fund for Lake Michigan, and it's a resiliency project. And so it's partners of TN, the Nature Conservancy, New Water, and Sea Grant. And uh, we have a collaboration to work with and coordinate and help bring those communities within the East River watershed. So I think it touches Manitowoc County even, um, all the way down to, yeah, the map of the East River. <laughs> so um, all communities, uh, and we're gonna be moving forward with a community of practice and then also doing hydrological modeling for the watershed to try to actually understand a little bit more of the hydrology going on uh, uh, with the with flooding specifically, and um, layer on that future risk due to climate uh, data projections. Cool. Thank you. Other folks, updates. I just have one kind of exciting update. Uh, the Brown County Board, like right not during the meeting that's happening right now is taking on a clean energy resolution. So hopefully that will all pass and we'll be able to collaborate further with them on some of our clean energy goals. So fingers crossed. That, that also includes a uh, discussion about sustainability in there too, right? Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. I think they would create a similar, a similar group to address some things internally um, on uh, at the county level and, yep. and then just provide more opportunities to collaborate with us. So, Other updates or we'll move on to our last item, the update on the resiliency coordinator position. 
Cool, let's do that. What's what's the good news on that? There we go. Well, um, so we in on the committee, we had just to go back a little bit, we had, I think, either I think we had 84 applications, which is really good. A lot of uh, recent grads, though. So we had whittled that down to eight people. We invited eight people to um, have an interview with us. So that was the screening process, screening applications, screening um, for uh, the resume. Eight people, one person said that she had gotten another job. So then we brought somebody up. So we had interviews with eight. It was a solid eight people. Um, that was Matt Heckenleibel, Julia, and the HR um, uh, coordinator. I'm not sure what Jen Smith's title is exactly. So we had uh, very lengthy days and some really good conversations. We had whittled that down to four people, uh, made a decision, made an offer to someone. Uh, unfortunately, he had some, um, made a different personal choice and decided not to join us. And so very sad, I'm very sad about that. Um, so, but I, you know, we wish this person very well. So we are going to go back to the drawing board with the, the candidates who had made it into the that second sort of set. And uh, Jen is gathering some information um, to see if they are willing to move forward and looking at September 30th to have a second conversation for us to make a final decision. So a little disappointing, but we're moving on. It's a pandemic, gosh darn it, you know? Everything is the pandemic's fault. <laughs> well, cool. That, that's, that's exciting that there's still a lot of uh, really good candidates. So can't mm -hmm. wait to, to hear about that next meeting. Um, I guess unless anybody has any questions on the resiliency coordinator, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. By Randy. Is there a second? I second. Second by Julia. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Cool. All right. Good to see everybody. Uh, hope, hope you're taking yeah. care. Uh, if I could just want, uh, if we could meet on Wednesdays like this, you know, right after a council.